when we look at the greatest challenges facing a movement, we often look at a movement's adversary or its political environment as two of the most challenging um, factors or issues that it has to address. But I would maintain that for certain movements, it's actually the internal factors that are the greatest challenge. One of those internal factors is the ability to unify. Almost by definition, not quite, but almost by definition, most people who are in the opposition have been divided in some way. It, uh, it's rare that I find I speak with someone who is in an opposition group that hasn't experienced a lot of division among other opposition groups in their country. And so there's this huge internal challenge to unify. <clears throat> not just among groups, but among populations, among different identities and so forth. And so if a group can just, if groups can just unify and begin to build a movement that's united, in fact tackling the quote unquote oppressive challenges, whether they be a government, corporation, or set of circumstances, may actually be uh, a lot simpler, a lot easier for them if they're able to get together and unify first. But then the question, of course, is how do people unify? And in the past, what I've focused on is looking at the role of language in discourse and messages and how movements are able to articulate certain messages, define what they stand for, define their adversaries, define their values, and so forth. But this year, I wanted to look at something different. So I'm going to focus on coalition building. How do groups work together within movements? What is the role of organizations within movements? My presentation is simple. First, I just want to define the terms coalition and movement. And then I'm going to talk about four different aspects of coalition building. Give a typology of coalitions, different kinds. Um, give a look at sort of costs and benefits of coalitions. Um, why do groups want to form coalitions to begin with? What are some of the costs and risks of doing so? Um, <clears throat> look at factors that promote the growth of coalitions or inhibit them. And as a coalition grows over time and changes, it experiences new stresses. Sometimes founding a coalition is much easier than sustaining it. And so through the course of a struggle, there may be new challenges that come and increase the coalition's cohesiveness and unity or reduce it. So I just I want to go into those four factors. And we don't have a lot of time. I wanted to go into depth into a bunch of examples, but I, I don't have time. So a lot of this presentation is going to be theoretical with a few examples here and there. But I think in this audience, how many people have worked in coalition before? Right? So we have plenty of experience to draw from. And like yesterday, I like a sort of dialogue format of presenting. So if you have great comments, just say them whenever. I would also point out that in this room, we have Ivan, who we saw him yesterday with Otpor trying to herd 18 opposition Serbian parties into one. That's certainly a coalition experience to draw on. We have Jim and Mary, who, <clears throat> whose experience in the civil rights movement certainly has a lot to tell us about coalition building. And we also have Howard Barrell, who just arrived yesterday. I don't know if you had a chance to meet Howard yet. But I've actually asked yeah, yeah. <laughs> this gentleman right here. Who will be presenting what later today, Howard? On? Um, violent flanks. On violent flanks. Howard is a veteran of the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa. There was a great deal of coalition work that happened there. And I've actually asked Howard to sort of be an informal respondent at the end of my remarks and shed some, uh, sh put some meat on the bones uh, with some examples from South Africa. OK. So definitions. Definition of a movement. This is my definition, anyway, that I've taken from a few sources and, and sort of remixed. Collective efforts aimed at bringing about consequential change could be social, economic, or political change. Movements are civilian-based, involve widespread participation. And they, I, I've, I've said they serve four functions. They alert educate, serve, and mobilize people. And <clears throat> again, a lot of times movements will 
you, you get emphasis on this mobilization aspect of movements, particularly public mobilization. But the service part can also be really critical, especially in the period before a movement gets, gets a lot of media coverage. The educational function can be really critical. Jim talked the other day about building the kind of community that could sustain a nonviolent mobilization. This is educational and service-based work. Um, so that's what I'm saying a movement is. What it's not is sort of a spontaneous outburst of frustration. What it's not is sort of a general, inchoate, unformed societal trend at least not for the purposes of this conversation. The term movement is, is overused a lot. Corporations use it, governments use it. It's not just a political party. And they use it because the term movement, it really implies that people like something. It's popular, it's legitimate. We, we do want to keep that there, but we want to keep it within the bounds of something that is sustained, collective, <clears throat> and pushing for some kind of economic, social, or political change. And what holds movements together, among other things, is legitimacy. They're voluntary. There is, no, there is no opportunity to command and control a movement. And this is a, hits on the point yesterday about how a movement is not like an organization necessarily, or not like a corporation. People cannot be paid to stay in movements. Maybe a few people can, but the vast majority are not. They cannot be threatened with sanctions if they don't join a movement. There are cases in South Africa and even India with social ostracism where people have suffered some some <clears throat> consequence of not being part of a movement. But overall, movements are largely voluntary. And then a coalition is exactly like it sounds. Groups working together. Organizations working together. Could be formal groups and organizations, could be informal ones. Their, their efforts together could be formal or informal, depending. But it's basically groups working together for a common purpose at any scale, local, national, international, regional, et cetera. Okay. <clears throat> now, one, one thing that I would, I'm not going to focus on it a lot in this presentation, but to keep in mind, I'm going to talk about movements as coalitions here. But if you're interested, just keep in mind the coalition frame of analysis for the adversary, too. Because you can look a little bit as we did yesterday as a government as a coalition or a corporation is a coalition of other groups. And so when I talk about what creates coalitions, makes strong ones or weak ones, think about it with regards to the other side as well. There are some really interesting lessons that can pop out. So here, I've made a visual. I'm an emerging PowerPoint artist. And <laughs> how do you like my work? So here's, um, <laughs> thank, thank you, thank you. I get better every year. Yes. Oh. Excellent, yeah, this was good, good. So as you can see, I am one with the movement. The movement is the big, the, the big uh, blue oval here. And then within it, I've got little organizations, right? These darker dots, these darker circles. Now, when organizations don't work in coalition, they may have a sphere of influence that extends you know, outside of their immediate uh, paid staff or members you know, and depending on the organization may extend a little, you know, a bit or, or not. <clears throat> and the hope is that when organizations form coalition, that those spheres, instead of being focused just around those particular organizations, ultimately can reach the point of being able to mobilize a large part of the movement space. So in terms of different types of coalitions, uh, this is just one slide, we can look at them as formal and informal. Um, <clears throat> pretty straightforward. Are the groups that create this coalition formal and informal, and are the agreements that they come to formal or informal? We can look at vanguard or integrative coalitions. Vanguard coalition is a coalition where one group has primacy, where one group's issues are the issues that all the other groups push for. So for example, a labor movement may be striking in a particular factory, and all other groups may line up behind it and want to support it. In contrast, you could have something like an integrative coalition. This is where a broader social change or economic change platform is proposed, and every coalition member pushes for that. 
It may not directly relate to their issue, but it's believed that by working together, they can all accomplish something that changes the whole playing field. So an example of that would be instead of, <clears throat> for example, a labor union or people trying to unionize a big store like Walmart, it would be people trying to get a living wage campaign across the board for all workers. And it's been argued, in fact, a lot of the literature that I looked in, because this is a pretty new topic for me, has to do with labor unions. And there are a lot of arguments saying that labor unions, which have been on the decline in many parts of the world for several decades, need to look into building movements. They need to look beyond just the issues of hours, working conditions, and wages, and engage in what's called social movement unionism link up with other groups to revitalize themselves, to change the whole playing field that is currently against them. You also have insider and outsider coalitions. And of course, some coalitions have both insider and outsider elements. Um, often the best ones do. OK. Civil rights movement is one example of, an, of a coalition that had both insider and outsider elements. And here is, you know, an interesting picture because we've all seen this, a picture like this before. But when, this is from the BBC's website, when you look at the different functions going on in Tahrir that are labeled here, you start to see that it's really an informal coalition at work. Sometimes our unit of analysis is just the movement or the mass, and we see it in images. But I thought this was really interesting because it shows just how much organization is going on among the groups, whether formal or informal, in this space to make this space what it is. And actually, if anyone wants, I can send the link to this website. It's got little rollovers, and you can learn more about each of these areas. It's quite interesting. OK. Potential coalition benefits. Any, any, what are they? What are they? Pardon? I mean, coalitions are stronger than the coalitions. So, leverage. You get more powerful. Exactly. Okay. There's a wider footprint. Mm hmm. <laughs> Diverse talent. Yep, new skills, new organizing ideas, sure. Actually, Cesar Chavez of the United Farm Workers. Um, the organization I talked to you about yesterday, he said if we only had farm workers, we'd only have about 30% of our great ideas. So he immediately saw the value of bringing in students, members of the churches, and he was particularly interested in people involved in the civil rights movement for ideas to infuse the United Farm Workers struggle. Yeah. Prevents the duplication of work for effort, which is more important, especially if you have limited resources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Larger network. Pardon? Larger network. Larger network. Really critical. And we'll go into why that's so important later, this idea of networking and connecting. Yep. Leah? Um, for, for networks that, uh, what did you call them, in, in, insider networks or mm -hmm. com combined ones, you can, it might be more sustainable mm -hmm. if, you have, if you have people who are sort of with all these different skills that's sort of over the long term. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, particularly for outsider groups, to get insider access, coalitions can be really valuable. On the other hand, well, there's also, and I'll give some examples of this later, insider groups that decide they really need a grassroots base, and they try to form coalitions with outsider groups. So they both need each other in different cases. Yeah? I think greater opportunity to get funded. Mm -hmm. um, we've worked with foundations for a number of years, and they're going to much more likely to um, fund a coalition rather than just a one-off organization. Sure. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. I didn't know that work together. They have more confidence that way. Uh -huh. Nice. OK. Yeah. I mean, coalitions also help people define themselves as a, like a micro society or as a, um, a sign of things to come rather than just defining themselves in opposition to what they're mm -hmm. fighting. Right? Yeah, it can promote a, a, a positive vision of what they're for. And to a certain extent, even promote a sense of identity, who we are, a new identity. Yep. Yep. Also, in some ways, it can kind of promote longe longevity, the uh, trajectory of the smaller organizations that are part of it. Mm -hmm. um, so, if one organization starts to crumble or starts to 
um, become ineffective, the other members of the coalition can find a way to come group around them to help support them, to help them build mm -hmm. um, the necessary that might not have happened if it was operating on its own. This is true. And this is, you know, so much of what I'm about to say is circumstantial. Because in some cases, what you're saying, I think, is absolutely right. And then in other cases, that could be the thing that stresses a coalition. Because if you start a coalition with a certain, certain power relationships among organizations, and if it's a formal coalition, you could say, OK, one organization, one vote. What happens if one organization gets really powerful? Another one starts getting weak. One grows. One, one diminishes. One's only giving financial resources, but the other one's giving grassroots support. And they're the ones taking the risk. And there can be all these different ways that, in the right circumstances, bring people together. But if without the, without the presence of really good bridge building can actually tear people apart. So it can work both ways. But yes, you're absolutely right. In cases in which there's trust, that can happen. Yeah, Les. I kind of wanted to kind of highlight what Leo was saying a little bit ago about the importance of the coalition for the transition. Mm -hmm. The transition may be easier after they win if a broader base is included in the process. Yeah. Yeah. OK, good. Good. So, I mean, there are a lot of benefits, and it almost easy to say, well, why don't more people work in coalitions? But we'll get into the costs and risks later, because there are some. Um, but the first one is fairly obvious, access to resources, more people, more funds, or material, and more material resources, skills and expertise, legal expertise, labor organizing expertise, expertise in computers, technology, transportation, whatever. Skills are really critical. They're a great resource. Um, when you think about uh, movement's adversary as a coalition, they really cherish the skills they have. Movement should do the same. And you know, an adversary, when we think of it as coalition, is very good at finding the absolute best ways to identify who has skills and use them. It's the same with any movement coalition as well. And then access to networks and contacts. Um, <clears throat> I don't want to go too much into this now, because I'm going to talk more about it later. But let's just say that the way in which coalitions are built has so much to do with who people know individually and trust networks. And I'll hit on that more later. But it's quite critical. And I'll give an example of, of a movement that I feel particularly personifies these three and more benefits of coalition building. And that is the US Civil Rights Movement. <coughs> In the period of, say, um, 1960 to 1965, uh, and I'll, I'm drawing from Doug McAdam, who is a great scholar of the civil rights movement, he talked about the big five organizations. The NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the Urban League, <coughs> the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, started by Martin Luther King, Congress of Racial Equality. I love this picture. Good photo op, Congress, Congress of Racial Equality, with Bobby Kennedy there with the bullhorn. And then, of course, there was a troublemaking organization called SNCC. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Hello, Mary. <laughs> Quite militant in their approach. They needed it now. I'm not telling. <laughs> and here's what Doug says about these five different organizations working in formal or informal coalition. Now, that doesn't mean that they got along all the time or didn't have disagreements. In fact, inside of, I think, every coalition that history would write about as a happy coalition, there are intense fights about all kinds of things. But here's what Doug writes, <coughs> and I'll let you read it yourself. And then there's a part two. <clears throat> and part of what Doug says that is striking to me is not so much what he says each group brought to the movement. It's actually, look at how he starts. The period of 1960 to 65 was marked by high levels of sustained activity, a succession of innovative tactics, and look at how he ends. 
in stunning legislative and legal victories that effectively dismantled legal segregation in the South during this period of what he would term coalitional work. Mary or Jim, did you want to add anything or have any comments about? Yeah, even though McAdams not one of my favorite <laughs> uh, scholars, <laughs> Uh, legislative louder the, the legislative and legal victories began the process of dismantling mm -hmm. but they were not as important as the direct action movement for dismantling mm -hmm. uh, uh, legal and and custom segregation and I don't agree that that uh, the Congress of Racial Equality and SNCC had more tactical bearing than some other local movements or those without engaged, or than the SCLC mm -hmm. in some of their uh, uh, efforts mm -hmm. at all. I mm -hmm. disagree with the thesis that um, <coughs> the, that SNCC was the militant. Mm -hmm. They were militant uh, mostly because, like other groups, they went out into the places where no movement had begun, working on fairly conservative goals, in my judgment. Mm -hmm. Voter registration, which in my judgment was a conservative goal, mm -hmm. important as it was. Mm -hmm. It was not a vehicle for the revolution of American society out of racism, sexism, violence, and greed. So I, I disagree with this analysis. The other thing is that uh, the movement caused what Martin King called a coalition of conscience, mm -hmm. where millions of Americans from across the land, from all walks of life, supported the push for the most progressive legislation that any president or Congress has ever passed in the history of the United States. From age or higher education, so students who have free education at the higher education level, to Head Start, to affordable housing so that nonprofits and local governments could compete with the real estate investment funds for making their housing in their communities affordable and mixed to job training programs. Well, I can't name everything. <laughs> but the most, the, 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 the period of the 60s, 1960, 1960 to 1968, was a period of offering some of the most radical political ways of doing business in the country, which is why the racist and the sexist have organized such a gigantic conservative movement. Why the Koch brothers poured billions of bucks mm -hmm. into trying to reverse it. Mm -hmm. I could go at length about this. And I think that the scholars of the movement have not got it yet. Mm -hmm. huh? <laughs> See, let me just tell you something. I, I, of course, of course. I would not your presentation, but I would like to make a couple of minor points. If you look in the dictionary at what the word radical means, is there anybody who knows what its root is, its origin? Radical. Say it again. 19th century promise. And that's it. Roots. Root. It means root. Radish. One of the capacities of civil resistance. A bunch of radishes in this <laughs> One of the properties of civil resistance, what makes it different from conflict resolution or management of conflict, is it has the capacity to go to the root of the problem. So when Jim says SNCC was organizing on conservative issues like voter registration, we were going on to plantations with sharecroppers who had no education, illiterate, and some of those plantations did not even use the US dollar. They used script, little scraps of paper. 
or you ran up a tally in the store on the plantation of how much fertilizer you had used. So we were going where no one else was going and activating local people to become involved in their own liberation. That's what radical really means. Now the other thing is, I used the word militant yesterday in talking about SNCC. I don't disagree with Jim on this at all, but when I say militant, for example, we adopted a policy of jail, no bail, mm -hmm. because we thought that was more Gandhian. I can't tell you the whole story, but that's one of the things that differentiated SNCC from the other groups, is when we went to jail, there was no bail. Mm -hmm. Well, I, let me understand. I am one of the founders of SNCC. <laughs> I mean, I'm not the godfather of SNCC. But I, also think, I, but I also think that I made mistakes in it back then. And I didn't learn it. Yeah, I didn't understand some of that. Well, so one, I didn't know what we were doing. So. One thing I've learned is that when presenting in front of you, Jim, and you, Mary, it is best to use someone else's quote than my own. <laughs> Because this is an intimidating front line. I have learned this every year at FSI. There is at least one time in which I am publicly corrected. So this is very, so I thought I'm putting McAdam up here. Well, I'm not, I'm not corrected, but I no, no, I, I, it's, it's good. I it's very useful. The, the scholars have not really gone in great depth to understand, and almost no scholarly book that I know of that's been written about the movement has unwrapped nonviolent direct action or has un unwrapped nonviolent philosophy, political theory, social theory, and so forth and so on. Not, not a single book that I know about. I, mean, I don't know all the books, but I keep reading them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So let's see. So coalition benefits, a fourth is, was alluded to you by you all earlier, is legitimacy. And uh, labor union examples keep coming to mind, so I'll give them. But I'm sure there are others as well. If a labor union is fighting for, again, increased wages, better working conditions, or better hours in a particular company or in a particular industry, Outsiders may be able to look and say, well, they're pursuing their own self-interest. They're another interest group. They're doing what they're doing because, <clears throat> because it benefits them. The benefit of a coalition, then, of people joining them is suddenly it says, well, why are all these people joining them? Suddenly their cause seems more than just about self-interest because other people have chosen to join it and support them. This is a picture taken in 1969 in Seattle of a whole bunch of people who are not farm workers saying, don't buy grapes at Safeway, which is a grocery chain. And so what is this doing? These people are probably, my guess would be drawn from church groups or uh, labor unions in the Seattle area, of which there are plenty. But suddenly, if you look at the farm workers and say, well, they just want what's best for them, well, then why are these people here? These people must see some connection. Uh, one <clears throat> uh, quote I heard about with regards to um, the Congress of South African Trade Unions, which was a coalition of trade unions in South Africa in the 1980s, was, uh, it was a quote, I believe, from Jay Naidu, who said, the struggle on the shop floor is one with the broader struggle against apartheid. And it was the ability to frame this one issue it was important to one organization that worked in coalition with a broader issue of justice that everyone could relate to. So legitimacy is... Yes, that, came, that statement about the worker struggle being connected with the community struggle was actually the product of a massive and prolonged argument among those who wanted the working class in the trade unions to remain independent of any mass-based community organization. Mm -hmm. And 1985, when this organization was formed, it represented the culmination of this debate and the victory for those who were maintaining, as Naidu enunciated, yeah. that actually the struggle on the shop floor was the same as the struggle in the community, but it came off to bitter struggle.
We'll see, and thank you, because this is the point that I keep coming across, is that when, you, when movements are written about from, from sort of a, a thousand feet up, the coalition always seems like it just did the right things and made some good choices. But the little bit that I hear from people who have worked in coalition or have read in terms of accounts shows arguments all the time. I mean, happy families can argue too, right? So it's just, I mean, there is tension. There is tension. And when we get later to what helps sustain coalitions or break them apart, you'll see all these forces pulling them together and all these forces simultaneously pulling them apart. It's, a, it's, a, it's like a cooker. It's like an oven of ideas and conflict that is held together by certain attributes. Revitalization of organization approach. I won't give examples of each of these. Development of new leaders. There is a role for people, bridge builders, uh, who have really good skills, which are sometimes underappreciated, to be able to translate between organizations to understand multiple organizational cultures and uh, movements that understand that this is a skill and something that's quite valuable will often have these people in leadership positions. Um, raising the public profile of various members of a coalition. And then what does all this do? It goes back to point six, again, increase strength and leverage. I don't know why PowerPoint changed my point eight to point six, but there you go. Increase strength and leverage. It's an overall function. Okay, so if it's so great, why ain't everyone doing it, right? So what are some of the costs and risks? Yeah. Can I give an example? Please. I don't know how to articulate it. Okay, yeah. Um, once there was a collision between different groups uh, advocating for Palestinian rights, and everyone, there were like the equal marriage rights groups, there were the Greens, the, um, the student groups, different ones, but then, and it was a shared standard and activity, but then among the coalition was also religious groups, and once their spokesman came up, he was the fanatic that no one wanted to hear, and like everyone was like, oh my god, oh my god. So it kind of undermined other other groups that were there because of the other members of the coalition that they wanted to raise awareness of, but he was kind of an embarrassment for the whole uh, initiative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very well said. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think the risk is uh, the movement can be tagged or uh, can be uh, you know hijacked as well uh, because uh, if you are bringing a collision of uh, different uh, groups, everyone has its own vision and they are coming for their uh, you know maybe someone is fighting for certain reasons, someone is fighting or uh, you know raising its voices for certain reasons. So I feel like to it can be hijacked once there's a collision or as you say that uh, maybe one is more powerful. They can, you know, uh, get uh, more consensus and become, uh, you know, on a higher seat, so they can hijack as well. So I think it, it's a higher risk. It is a higher risk, for sure. Yeah, have it. Um, yeah, I'd like to see reiterate the numbers, but I think this is like, um, like you don't often like your friends' friends. And like, even if you're, you're happy with your friends and your coalition, you have their other coalitions, and suddenly your bedfellows, once removed, can get into very kind of shady territory that you don't want to be associated with. But mm -hmm. I think another thing is um, coalition building, if you start it's such a like, time-consuming effort that if you're not concerned yes. about it, it can become an end in itself and your, your organization just becomes a coalition building machine. It's like a high-maintenance relationship. It just keeps <laughs> taking from you and you say, what, what point do I cut this off? Yeah. Is it worth it yet? <laughs> No, but it, what, what, what Heather is saying is absolutely true. On the one hand, if every organization wants to do their own thing, and then coalition, being in coalition is just one more thing they do at the end of the day, the coalition probably won't last, because they do take energy. But then how much, what's the optimal amount of energy they should take is this whole other issue. I feel like I should go to this side of the room. <laughs> so there are lots of comments. Andreas. I also just wanted to give an example uh, your remarks made me think about, which is the, the so-called social justice protests that happened in, in Israel last summer. And they were, they were basically fighting for, like, it's, it was mainly um, kind of young people who are in precarious employment situations or young families or students who couldn't afford to rent apartments anymore, so they were going on the street to demand more social justice. But um, by the time the coalition brought them to such an extent, including um, settlers, including um, 
all kinds of uh, people that that their objective was not reachable anymore because the coalition became so broad that mm -hmm. their mm -hmm. the means to achieve the actual target, which is social justice, mm -hmm. was not possible with consensus yeah. anymore because um, because people who took part in the protests were actually part of the reason why there is no social justice. Uh, there's, you know, it's so part of what I part of what your comment makes me think about is this issue of coalition size. Is bigger better? Do you want the maximum number of groups you can get in coalition? Or, you know, there's this the term letterhead coalition. Like, we're a coalition and we're going to list them all on the side of our, you know, of our stationery. How many groups do you want on your letterhead? And, and it may depend on circumstance, but sure, because that dilution can happen. Yeah, I think I may uh, concern on the issue of the message address in the coalition. Because it, it's quite difficult. For example, uh, my experience uh, working with a different kind of women's group in Indonesia. You, if you build coalition, of course, you are not going to work with only progressive uh, uh, women group, right? You have to to uh, to extend your coalition, even including the conservative one. And the time that you have to decide what message actually that we need to deliver, that is the really big tension. Is that everybody have to debate? To, to come into the common ground. Mm. So that is, uh, uh, but again, if you come to the field, for example, then you will see that if you are not really uh, control what message that you're gonna put on the public, then the other group will may say very conservative thing, which is against the consensus, for yes. example. So I think it's, 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 a, it's a risk uh, if you not really control what kind of message that you're gonna put on. Okay, we'll take a few more. I saw, oh, we'll just take the rest. Leah, DJ, oh boy, Ramu. <laughs> Can we make them quick? Yeah. Leah, DJ, Ramu. I like hearing your comments, Raja and Rumbi. Um, smaller organizations are just more nimble, make decisions faster, mm -hmm. get things done. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, in the same way that I was saying how you are chasing the media, the media will begin to control your message and what you say and do. If you are chasing coalitions for legitimacy, and so if you're chasing larger, more established organizations for legitimacy, then you will allow their expectations, rules, and culture to co-op what your movement is actually trying to accomplish. So in building your coalition, you eventually evolve into an entirely different movement other than what you intend to be. Mm -hmm. It certainly happened. Brahma? I think about uh, one important factor in the coalition. Yeah. The coalition building is that uh, while the common minimum program of the coalition could be a cost to be very high and a greater one, but there is an unequal situation among the partners. Mm -hmm. And this is both perceived and reality. So there's a, always a negotiation, the voice for bargaining, the justice has to prevail within the coalition to pursue the higher goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK, we had Raja, and then we had one more. Yeah, Raja. Maybe I won't be as short as everyone else, sorry. So I want to talk a little bit about the distinction between like coalition in the movement and coalition in organization. Mm -hmm. And I will focus on the Syrian case, because like we were talking about unity uh, of the opposition since more than one year. Mm -hmm. And actually, they like to have a coalition in the movement, it should be a, like unifying message, we have unifying message, we have unifying strategy, and unifying technique. But the problem that was happened between different committee in Syria, it seems that we, we don't agree on the message, actually. Some people want, like, there's agreement on troubling the regime. Everyone wants to trouble the regime, but some people don't agree on, like, the um, method of troubling the Syrian regime. This is one point. Another point that SNC, Syrian National Council, they made a big coalition between different people, the liberal people, the Muslim Brotherhood, and, and also the Syrian movement on the ground. And everyone had different objectives, and everyone had different structure, and then it was actually to keep the structure of the SNC is the objective. It's not right. like changing the objective, which is like we have this coalition, basically, but how we can keep it. So I think, as we said yesterday, having the strategy from the beginning, as she said, having the message from the beginning before, like 
plan everything in advance is more important than having the coalition and then see what we will deal with later. Mm -hmm. Great. I, well, I want to I want to say one thing. Some of the comments that have been said, I think some of the later presentation points will start to address them about how coalitions are built, what kind of factors make good coalitions. Uh, I said we take Rumbi. I want to recognize Howard after that because I've asked him to be particularly intervening. But uh, Rumbi, you were next, and then. Yeah. Okay. Did you want to make a direct no, no, comment? No, I'll take Rumbi and then okay. go, Howard. Yeah. Okay, um, so I have a specific example of how sometimes um, the idea of coalitions working on the basis of consensus can actually sort of destroy the movement. And um, I have the example of the Zimbabwean situation where uh, since 1999 there has been a coalition of organizations that have been pushing for uh, a new constitution in Zimbabwe. And then just um, beginning last year, a new constitution making process uh, uh, started. The process was led by a parliamentary portfolio committee. And the National Constitution Assembly is the organization, or rather the coalition that's been pushing for a people-driven constitution, felt that this process was not as people-driven as they would have wanted it to, mm -hmm. um, uh, because it's being led by parliament, as such, and not from the grassroots. So um, they wanted to boycott the whole process, the parliamentary-led process. But then uh, some members of the coalition felt that they should support the process that's being led by parliament and see what sort of an outcome that would have. Mm -hmm. So in the end, because there was no agreement within the coalition that, that, that's been leading the, uh, the constitution, um, constitution advocacy, um, they um, then created serious divisions uh, amongst themselves. And so now the National Constitutional Assembly that exists is like a, an organization, uh, but not the whole coalition of, of other institutions, such as the Zimbabwe Congress of Trade Unions and all the other people who were part of the movement. And so now the movement for a people-driven constitution has almost collapsed. And as a result of that, so sometimes it can be quite problematic. Quite, yeah. yeah. Right. Indeed. Howard, yeah. I just wanted to pick up the point made about the media a moment ago. Um, Al Giordano and I had a brief discussion about this last night, and we disagreed completely with each other, which is, which is very healthy. I just want to make the point that this notion that I've heard now expressed two or three times uh, since arriving yesterday that somehow the media is like this kind of vampire spirit that's going to suck the blood out of the movement and change it into something different. I think we have to be very, very careful with this kind of thinking. I think in the first instance it's defeatist. In the second instance, as somebody who did during the struggle against the party work with another group, a group of generation of journalists, and used the media quite, I think, quite effectively, even though I make the claim on my own behalf and on behalf of this group, the media can be used. The established media can be used. You can intervene creatively and to good effect for the movement within the, in the established media. And I think there are ways of doing this. And we've got to be very, very careful of imagining that because something has a different set of interests uh, from those interests that we are ourselves trying to develop, um, that therefore it is something that is inevitably going to, in some sense, because of the power, going to take us over or in some way pervert our struggle. It does not follow, and it need not follow. It is always a danger when you enter into some sort of uh, Faustian pact or other kind of pact with other people that you can, in fact, have your cause perverted. But it does not follow that it will. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, I think one thing I want you to take away from this presentation in general as I go over factors that make coalitions difficult or easier, none of this is determinative. That I can't say anything in fact, I will give you a whole bunch of factors that make coalition building tough, and then I'll give you an example of a coalition that succeeded despite all of those factors being present. So it's none of it's determinative. So much depends on the people and the networks of trust. I want to take you, but I have to keep going, Mary. There's one thing that's really important. <laughs> <laughs> Can, is it under 20 seconds? Yeah. Okay. Which is that technically with the coalition, the coalition cannot take a stance unless all of the groups that are members have agreed. That's what slows it down and makes it ponderous. Nevin and Imran both mentioned things pertaining to this. It's the going back to consult with all the members to get agreement that makes it so unwieldy. Mm -hmm. So you guys have pretty much covered these three points. Um, you know, I, just, I guess to point out two more would just be, if a sometimes a coalition is successful, and what this can do is grassroots groups that are part of the coalition finally achieve insider access. 
and when they achieve insider access, one risk of actually the coalition's success, but a risk to them is that they become very consumed with insider access and not necessarily serving the grassroots anymore. You know, they can all get hired by well-funded NGOs, for example, and pretty soon that grassroots support doesn't exist anymore. Um, <clears throat> let's look at factors that promote coalition formation. So there's some obvious ones, shared ideology objectives and or means for achieving them. Shared identities are another. But these first two points are not necessarily just factors because it's like, oh, we're similar, now we can work together, not at all. It actually, so much, not all, but a lot comes actually down to bullet points three and four. Personal, social ties, trust, <coughs> and organizational history. You know, the, I was reading a chapter about this, um, and this guy made a quote. He said, I believe his name was Brian, what was it? No, I forget what his name was. Um, or it was, a, it was several people who wrote it. And the point was, the decision of an individual to join a social movement is akin to the decision of an organization to join a coalition. And to reiterate part of something I said earlier, the decision of individuals to join movements and to participate in them is, a lot of the literature shows, influenced by their social ties, how strong they are, how many people they know, and if my friends are in the movement, I may well join the movement and become quite active. It's not the only reason people join, but it's a significant factor. <coughs> so why does an organization join a coalition? A lot of times because people who work in that organization know people in other organizations or have worked in those very organizations. This is where personal social ties, trust, and organizational history comes. Why is it that people with shared ideologies or shared identities may be more likely to form coalitions? It may be because they hang out together more in the first place. It may be because they built up a network of trust, you know, that because they simply have more association with each other. And I want to give one example of this, um, which I saw documented in the literature, <clears throat> and that is the coalition Win Without War, which was founded in 2002, October 2002, and it was a coalition to try to um, basically prevent the U.S. from waging war in Iraq, and more broadly a coalition trying to fight against militarization uh, in the United States. And it was founded by five people, each representing five different organizations. Okay? It ultimately had 41 members. So the founders, those five who represented five different organizations, represented 12% of the organization. They directly knew 58% of that coalition's members. They went through their Rolodexes, they called people they knew, and ultimately 70% in that coalition of 41 groups were either the people who founded it or the people they directly knew, had worked with before, and so forth. Then the people, their friends' friends, invited another six people representing 15% more of that coalition. So we can say 85% of that coalition was within one or two degrees of separation from the founders. And then <clears throat> four groups asked to join, and two groups were specifically sought out by the founders to join. Harvey, can I just highlight a, a danger in, in this kind of social bonding? Yes. I'm, I'm not saying it's good, by the way. I'm saying it's interesting. Because this was exactly, this <laughs> Let's was exactly, discuss. This was exactly the reason why Weimar Republic, after the First World War that was created in Germany, collapsed. <laughs> because one of the scholars who is looking at the social capital was arguing that various civic society groups that uh, were very active in Weimar Republic, they were bonding together based on the common ideology, common views, strengthening their prejudices mm -hmm. against other groups. So they were building coalitions just within themselves, within the same class, within the same group of people that finished the same universities. They, they, they came from the same social and economic background. Uh, and this type of capital was called the bonding capital instead of building a bridging capital uh, be beyond the groups that we know. And he was arguing that that actually uh, contributed to the collapse of the Weimar Republic and the emergence of the eventual Nazi uh, takeover of power. So this, this issue of trust 
and trust networks is really critical. It's, in a sense, it's something that academia would study and then tell us something that seems obvious. You know, of course, we invite who we trust. If I, you asked me to form a coalition, I'd immediately look at who I knew, right? And yet, and this is just one example, not all coalitions may be of this degree in terms of familiarity, but it's quite telling. And it has some pros and it has some cons. And it's logical, actually, from a cost-benefit analysis in the sense that it takes a long time to get to know people, discover what their preferences are, and then trust them. And if we look at that as a, as a significant expenditure of resources, seeking out new groups, you've got to find them, you've got to know what their preferences are, what the, how they work, and then you've got to figure out if they're trustworthy, why not go with the people you already know, right? It, 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 in a sense, it, 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 that, it has its own rationality. Now, we may look at groups politically and say, these two groups really should work together, and they're not. Well, that's where it becomes irrational, because if they don't know each other, it's very unlikely that they will. Not impossible, but unlikely. Um, and if they do work together, the chances for those intense, heated arguments to really push things apart may increase because they still haven't established trust. One other. I think implication that comes out of this is that we should see coalitions like this one, and again I'm just drawing one example, but I think it's representative of how a number of coalitions work, as coming out of long-term processes. It wasn't just five people sitting down and saying let's form a coalition. The entire coalition in a sense was formed through years of associations and working together and finally calling in that social capital and saying, let's form it into something. And so when you look at a, at, at a coalition, which often will, you know, within movements there are often coalitions that are critical to, their, uh, to the movement's functioning, it's interesting to look at all the associational networks that predated a coalition's rise. Another factor that can promote coalition is the political and institutional context. And Governments have the capacity, as I said yesterday, to create shared identities and experience or to try to create lots of separate identities and experience. And so if government passes a lot of different legislative uh, acts of legislation targeting each little group differently, it has the potential to make each group very preoccupied with what's affecting them even down to the level of the committees a government has. If a government sets up tons of specialized committees for every single different segment of policy, groups can all become very interested in activating their particular committee that relates to their preferred policy. But when policies are broad and cut across a lot of different groups, there's this potential for shared experience, there's this potential for people who wouldn't normally talk to talk, and here we see people protesting against the draft in the Vietnam War. A policy that created an identity or a sense, of, a sense of shared identity or consciousness that lent itself to coalitional work. In the same way, elections often, you know, coalitions often spring up around elections. Um, though as I'll get to, well I won't have time to make it through my whole presentation so maybe I'll just say it now. Governments can also try to limit coalitions and elections. I read a really interesting <coughs> um, chapter um, that talked about, for example, in the United States tax law and how a lot of nonprofits that may be very interested in coalitional work around elections cannot do so because of their tax status will not allow them to get, engage in direct political work. Labor unions can. But then if labor unions can do it and all these other nonprofits cannot, it means they're not working together a lot, developing the necessary level of networks and organizational trust that would lead to broad coalitions during elections. So it's really interesting how the government can try to channel coalitional and social movement activity. That's just in this country. I mean, every country is different, but very interesting to think about how the laws are set up to do this. Threats. For example, Darren. Yeah, so a quick uh, comment tying back to your presentation yesterday and actually some comments that, that Mary made earlier in the week and actually Jim made last year is I think there might be an assumption that the larger the goal or the broader the vision of a movement, 
the easier it may be to form a large coalition. Mm -hmm. But it got me thinking, and Brian, you might be able to chime on this as well, there's there is the larger environmental movement, climate activists, people are trying to curb climate change and obviously influence people's behaviors and policies to, to do that. Mm -hmm. But part of that larger movement, one of the sub campaigns was to prevent the construction of the Keystone XL pipeline. Mm -hmm. And that formed, just around that campaign, a very diverse coalition, not of just environmentalists, but right. also farmers, those who are right. opposed to eminent domain, yep. people who are addressing issues of lobbying and influence of money in politics, people that if you try to build a coalition around climate change more broadly, right. probably wouldn't jump on the wagon. So this idea of, Mary, you were saying this earlier, that Gandhi didn't have this he didn't put forward a vision of you know ending capitalism or whatever. He had very specific goals that I think made it a little more likely that larger coalitions could actually form around that. And Jim, last year you were saying that, or maybe two years ago, that sometimes it's not relevant or not important to start with, we have to build a coalition before we do the direct action because you were saying the sit-ins, a lot of people are like, this is a horrible idea, we don't want to go along with this. And so you said, fine, we're going to do it. We're going to show you how successful it is, and then you will come to us and want to be part of our coalition. And so I think it's important to mention that the smaller the goals can actually lead to the you know to larger coalitions. And starting with the action can lead to to coalitions as opposed to waiting for larger coalitions. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, because everyone wants to be part of a winner, among other reasons. I mean, the minute someone starts winning, I'd like to be their friend. Well, not everyone, but you know what I mean, right? <laughs> no, I mean, in a social movement, everyone can argue about ideology or whatever they want when no one's getting somewhere, and some group starts succeeding, and people say, they're doing something that works. So, it, you know, it, it does attract. Darren, your first point about this pipeline, which for people in the room was a pipeline coming down from Canada to bring dirty oil from Canada down to Texas, got a coalition against it, relates to my next slide, which is threats. A threat can overcome ideological differences. And here we have nurses supporting Occupy. When I talked earlier about people uh, who advocate social movement unionism, the idea that unions are under such threat that they need to form coalitions to survive now is, is one such example of, of threats um, and their role in bringing groups together. Keep in mind, Occupy had a very different organizational culture than labor unions. Significant barriers and risk to even trying to work with Occupy. And yet you did definitely see some labor support, in part probably because of a sense of shared threat. Now some would also argue that it's a combination of threats and political opportunity that lead to coalition. And there's a really interesting example of this um, that I was reading about. And by the way, I'll give you a list of all my sources in the end if people want to look further into these. And this is a case in Ecuador. And in 1986, about half of the indigenous population in Ecuador um, formed the Confederation of the Nacionalidades Indígenas del Ecuador. That's my bad Spanish accent for you. Conai. And it represented what Amazonian and Highland indigenous people, <clears throat> mostly I believe it grew beyond that. And it was actually a coalition, in the, it was a group in the beginning, you could call it a, that group itself a coalition of different indigenous groups that did not want to get directly involved in politics. But at the same time, Ecuador was undergoing a period of democratization. In 1979, military dictatorship ended, or military rule ended, dictatorship, and turned into a democracy. In 1984, uh, the literacy test to vote in Ecuador was abolished. Keep in mind that many indigenous Ecuadorians were illiterate and therefore could not vote. And suddenly in 84, the electoral process was open to them. So there was this political opportunity. There was this opening. And in 86, Conai was formed. And Konai did not want to get formally involved in electoral politics and did a great deal of grassroots actions, blockades, strikes, boycotts, so forth. Now here's the threat. Neoliberalism, structural adjustment, privatization, taking of lands. And so Konai, which had now political space to function, the opportunity was facing this threat of neoliberalism. And in 1990, they waged a land campaign 
they waged campaigns against water privatization. They, got, they had some success in campaigns against oil extraction, though not complete success. And in 1996, there was a referendum uh, that was, I think it had 11 points, and it was a threat not just felt by indigenous people, but also by student groups, traditional leftist labor groups, urban groups um, in Ecuador. And those groups formed their own coalition called the Coordinadora de los Movimientos Sociales to fight against this referendum. They started working with CONAI. So the opportunity of space, the threat of neoliberalism brought them together and this referendum was defeated by 60%. This led to the establishment of a political party. And so here, this is very interesting. And then this political party, which sprung directly from these social movements, had a social movement base and was using nonviolent action as well as traditional electoral politics in coalition with these groups to struggle. I thought this was a very interesting example. There are numerous others as well. Uh, other examples are in Bolivia um, <coughs> of, pol of political parties coming directly out of social movements that in part were able to coalesce around issues <coughs> of fighting privatization and structural adjustment. Another factor that can promote coalition formation is elimination of alternatives. And here, Ivan, I have the democratic opposition of Serbia as an example of a coalition that formed because Odpor effectively and other groups eliminated alternatives. If you weren't part of this 18 political party coalition, you didn't have a place in Serbian politics unless you were with Milosevic. And Otpor, according to one case I read, even said, we'll deliver half a million votes in a country of 10 million people to this, to this coalition. Um, so that was another strategy for getting groups to work together that may not otherwise. OK. Can I, can I take? a little bit more time since we started late? Ten minutes? Or is the, the break so sacred? Because I have a few more things to say. I wanted to open it up to, pardon? Nothing is sacred. <laughs> Nothing is sacred. <laughs> Let's contemplate that. Um, let's see. Because I want to give one more example. I want to give Howard the floor because he's agreed to share some of his experience with us um, briefly afterwards. And then maybe we can close. So factors that inhibit coalition formation are fairly obvious in the sense that they're the opposite of some of the factors that we mentioned before. Lack of personal social ties and trust. An organizational history in which perhaps organizations have worked together and the coalition has failed, or an organization has felt exploited. The political and institutional structure, as I talked about earlier, the government channeling groups, even giving them different statuses so some can organize during elections and others can't because they can't be political and trying to make sure that people, it's not so much not work in coalition, it's, again, it's not even work together on anything, not have the common associational and trust networks. Different ideology, ends and means, different identities, and then organizational structure and culture. I would point out that labor unions that have been threatened by the World Trade Organization and globalization have not all endorsed anti-WTO uh, demonstrations. Some of this may be due to differing ideas of means. I think some is also due to a different organizational structure. Unions often hierarchical. Anti-WTO organizations, to, to the extent that I can see, not so hierarchical. Yet, yet, these factors are not necessarily determinative. And I want to give an example, which Howard will speak about later in South Africa of an organization that overcame quite a few of these, or a coalition. And that is the United Democratic Front. And the United Democratic Front um, formed in the early 1980s. <clears throat> and it was a nonviolent coalition of about 700 local civic groups fighting for a wide variety of issues, but often in a local context. Could be access to services, could be clean water, could be desegregation of certain facilities. And this is when the anti-apartheid movement was shifting much more from violent struggle to nonviolent struggle. Officially, the line of the African National Congress was still violent revolution. But it became clear that what was really working was nonviolent struggle. And the United Democratic Front, with its 700 groups, was, was, was 
quite a big part of that progress. Now, <clears throat> one of the first campaigns of the United Democratic Front was against something called the tricameral parliament. Okay? This was an attempt, let's go back to our list, by the South African government to channel dissent. It was an attempt to create a political and institutional context that would inhibit coalition formation. What they said was, in 1982, if you're a black South African, you have no representation in parliament, but you can be part of, you can elect your local officials at the town, township or city level, and they'll you know, manage certain local affairs. If you're a person of mixed race, then you can have some representation in the national parliament. You can have your own house of parliament with some members. If you're a person of Indian descent, you can have your own house of parliament. And then us white people will have our own house of parliament, which will have more members and be bigger and have more power. But then everyone's going to have their own thing, right? Because <laughs> if you're black, you'll have some local control, and then other people have parliamentary. So this tricameral parliament attempt to get everyone focused on pursuing their self-interest, not working coalition, completely backfired completely backfired. Dead on arrival in terms of, sure, some people ran for office, but immediately the groups were able to say, this is an attempt to create an institutional context toxic to coalition building. We're going to actually build a coalition that fights against this. So institutional structure failed. Different ideology ends or means. Um, <clears throat> there were people coming from the black consciousness movement in South Africa that did not want to work with white people. Keep in mind, for example, the South African Student Organization in the 1970s officially split off from working with progressive white student groups, saying, we're going to do this ourselves. We, do, we, don't, we don't want to work with you. In the 1980s, actually, they came together again and formally united, I believe, in 1988. Um, but there were people of different ideologies. And talk about arguments. I was talking with Janet Cherry a few years ago, who participated in you know, in, in the UDF a great deal. She said they even argued about what color the posters should be. Should the posters be the color of the ANC? Well, no, because that might get the, the UDF banned. So they chose red and black. Um, <clears throat> so you had all this tension. You had tension of what kind of unity are we going to call for? Racial unity? Non-racial unity? Class unity? All these different ideas. Um, and then organizational structure and culture, the UDF, was, you could say, informally in coalition with the African National Congress. The African National Congress was an organization that said armed struggle is the way we're going to liberate South Africa. And here the UDF, without, which said violence and self-defense is OK. They didn't condemn violence in all its forms, but largely had a different sense, set of means about how to achieve it. And here you have a sign. UDF demands unban the ANC. So you have all, all these potential factors that can inhibit coalition building being overcome here. It's, 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 it's quite something. Um, <clears throat> so there were a whole bunch of other points I was going to make. I think I'm going to just make one more and then stop. My presentation is available online for you to see it. Um, but the last point is political opportunity can sometimes inhibit coalition building. And I think there are some obvious examples of this to a certain extent in Egypt and Ukraine. After dictators fell, lots of potential political opportunity, lots of chances for people to pursue self-interest coalitions start to fray. And if I had more time, I'd talk about the importance of positive vision and not just negative vision in keeping coalitions together through that time because a positive vision says, here's what we want to achieve beyond maybe just a transition of power. Here's the society we want. That becomes the basis of unity. Um, now, if we think about this from the regime perspective for a second, think about this. We talked about threats earlier as something that can bring people together. So when a movement starts winning, the regime coalition feels threatened, and it can start to coalesce. Some members may split off because of nonviolent movements, but others may unite under threat. And this is why, for every revolution, you start to see a counter-revolution at the same time. This is why, in 1955, after the Montgomery bus boycott, you saw a certain amount of coalitional activity among white groups that were trying to stop the civil rights movement from going on. This is why you see SCAF. In Egypt, they really come together and united around a sense of threat. So the co these dynamics work, work both ways. 
I think I will stop there. And Howard, love to hear any additional insights you have from your experience. Can I stop here? Yeah. Can you know, I just want to pick up on something you just said because it seems to me to be very critical and helps to explain the cycle of uh, two steps forward, one step backward, or two steps forward, two steps backward, the staggered uh, phasing of progress toward genuine rights and democracy. To the extent, it seems to me, and I, I can make this as a historical remark, to the extent that movements are seen as instrumental for a specific political purpose and seen as having a momentary role rather than as being a valid, organic, enduring expression of the people's will. To that extent, they will be more easily abandoned when it appears as if there has been, at least mechanically, delivery on certain political goals. And the problem with that is, if you, if, you were to, if you were to build your own car and drive it across the country from Los Angeles to New York in the United States and get to New York and say, oh, we're in New York, we don't need this car anymore. You're stuck in New York. A movement, it seems to me, should be understood instead as such a, an expression of the vitality of the will of those who have organized it and used it to express their own, their own sense of political and social identity and have it as a vehicle for voice, that there ought to be significant hesitation before abandoning that as a vehicle for change, simply because there appears to be a political victory. And my observation about this phenomenon is that to the and, and this is a this is a I think I think movements fall prey to the sense that what they are doing is something that is instrumental. What they are doing is something that is that is uh, uh, opportunistic rather than something that is deeply expressive of who they feel they are and that until a real transformation has occurred, it's probably not a good idea to demobilize. Okay. Right, I'm going to um, be quite brief. I'm just, I've got two slides here, and uh, I'm going to just try to extrude or pull out some of the kind of underlying thinking that there was in the coalition building that uh, led to the formation of the United Democratic Front in South Africa that Hardy has mentioned and spoken about. And Hardy's emphasis on the disagreement that there were, the extent to which things were contested bitterly, families were split up, you know, friendships were broken and lost in the course of many of the arguments that took place. So if I now make it seem as if somehow this thing was easily decided, I'm, I'll be misleading you. So I, what I'm going to present is a series of results, but what lay behind them was serious contestation at every single point. Okay. Now, uh, if we go back to, just to get ourselves up to speed, it was formed in 1983. It was an umbrella national organization. Umbrella, okay, for those of us who are not native English speakers, something that you put everything under to protect it from the rain. So a whole lot of little existing organizations, okay, or the sun, depending on where you come from. But a whole lot of existing organizations, okay, were combined together in this loose federation, this kind of national umbrella. And the idea was that these loose organizations, these different organizations, which had, as Hardy, as, as Hardy sorry, has pointed out, many different kinds of interests. Some were religious groups representing Christians or Muslims or Jews or Hindus. Some were workers' groups, women's groups, artists' groups, poets' groups, scholars' organizations, students' organizations. You name it, they were there. Organizations to support detainees who were in prison, their families while they were in prison. These were all represented and were existing organizations which then affiliated to this national umbrella organization. Why? Because what was the, 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 the kind of thinking that was then developing was that these kinds of problems that these individual organizations had could only finally be resolved by addressing the issue of national state power. 
Okay? In the end, mobilized as these uh, organizations did, when required the resolution of the issue of state power for those grievances and problems to be finally corrected. Now, how did this, the UDF achieve this kind of spread? Well, there was in its thinking, thinking there were very bright, some very bright people involved, one man called Popo Malefi, particularly uh, mature in his outlook, who became the general secretary of the UDF. The thinking was that we had to maximize the breadth and strength of our own forces, okay? all Democrats, loosely defined, and we did define it loosely. We had to maximize our own strength and our own forces. We had to win the middle ground. Okay? You win the middle ground. And if you manage to win somebody from the far ground to the middle ground, that's a victory. Okay? Even though they haven't joined you, it's still a victory. They're not with the opponent anymore. Okay? And in the process of doing those two things, to isolate the opponent to the maximum. You wanted a situation which eventually emerged where P.W. Boerter the president in the dying days of apartheid, not quite the final days, was actually being deserted by his own intelligence and security chiefs. That's the kind of situation that you want. Okay? And in order to achieve that objective, we had to avoid sectarian positions. The point made by Hardy earlier. One of the issues that arose was, were we going to, was the UDF going to adopt the Freedom Charter, which was an organization very much identified with the ANC tradition? And although most of the organizations involved in the UDF in the early days were people from an ANC perspective. The decision was taken, no, we will not adopt the Freedom Charter because we do not want to drive away some people in the middle ground. We can still win to our, to our, to our organization. So we delayed it, and it was, then was adopted, I think, after 1985. There was also a rival organization to the United Democratic Front called the National Forum, which set itself up, in fact, as a rival, and adopted a set of sectarian positions, sort of trying to make out that they were more radical, they were more socialist, or they were more anti-racist than the UDF was. But we observed how their sectarian positions narrowed their base, and we were, deter we were determined not to repeat their kind of, of error. And we adopted a slogan which could scarcely be broader, which was the UDF denies, unites apartheid divides. Apartheid did divide. It was definitionally about division. Now, in the South African context, the UDF needed to build coalitions. There was no way it could not. There were four designated racial groups, which over the, the, the various kind of perversions of uh, society that white colonialism had developed in Southern Africa, these different groups had different interests. And we had to build a coalition to seek to unite these various interests. We had to overcome these racial divisions where we possibly could. We also had to overcome class divisions among the oppressed populations. There were some who were rich, there were some who were traders, there were many who were very poor. And we had to ensure as far as possible that uh, uh, these divisions were overcome where they existed. There were also ideological uh, uh, differences. Some people were more socially conservative than, than others. Some were more prone to wanting an interventionist state in economic affairs than were others. We also had to overcome the fear of minorities. And uh, this was a very important thing because one didn't want a situation where all whites were uh, uh, thrust across or uh, felt they had to remain on the side of the apartheid government uh, tacitly or, or by declaration. And there were also other very significant minorities from whose ranks the liberation movement had over the preceding 60-odd years drawn very substantial strength. There was a group of uh, uh, South Africans of, of Indian origin who had been brought out as indentured slaves uh, in the late uh, 19th and early 20th century, from whom there had been an extraordinary intellectual, uh, particularly an intellectual uh, um, uh, contribution. Uh, and one wanted to ensure that that was broadened and these people remained in the broad democratic movement. There was also the, the so-called colored races or the mixed race people in South Africa from whom also there had been important intellectual and also other organizational input. So one needed to ensure that the minorities uh, who were potentially allies were uh, built into the coalition and were secured as allies. 
And as a consequence of this, the UDF laid out a carefully measured set of objectives. The first was a unitary state. That is a state which was not a loose association of uh, areas which one of which might be white dominated and very rich, another 16 might be black, uh, mainly black and very poor. It wanted, there, there had to be a unitary state in which the, uh, the wealth of the country was uh, 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 distributed and made available to people and the benefits of being South African was made available to, to people, were made available to people um, by a central state. It also had to be a majoritarian state. It could be nothing else. By majoritarian, I mean a, a state in which, in the government of it, the will of the majority prevailed. It had to be a majoritarian state. One could not correct a 300-year colonial historical injustice inflicted against the minority without making South Africa a majoritarian state. But, at the same time, I return to the need to uh, mitigate the fears of minorities. And in order to do that, there had to be a very clear commitment to it being a pluralist, a pluralistic majoritarian state. In other words, in other words a state in which, or a constitution in which the views of the minority would be respected and would be dealt with very sensitively. So that was another part of, of the uh, sort of political vision that was laid out. So it was a unitary, majoritarian, pluralist democracy that we said we were fighting for, which was, for the vast majority of South Africans, completely unobjectionable. It was very difficult to object to that. Now, what did this process of coalition building involved? involve? Well, I've been thinking about this, and to my mind, it involved uh, coalition building in which people sought to identify what single basic aim they could agree that they shared? What single basic aim could they agree that they shared? And I, when I say single basic age, and I, uh, um, uh, aim, and I stress the word basic, what I'm talking about is what aim could they put before the majority of people that was simple and clear and easily understood? Not some theoretical Marxist nonsense or whatever, or theoretical whatever nonsense, but some clear, simply stated aim. And the, th the second was what methods to achieve that shared aim could all members or all desired members of the uh, UDF agree were necessary as methods to achieve that aim. Not were sufficient, but what were necessary. And what it was easy for everybody to agree was that one necessary method was popular mobilization of people by peaceful methods around legal activity, even if pursuing legal activity meant that one had to work within a, a state of semi-illegality because the regime was always wanting to repress you whether you were obeying the law or not. But we could all agree that a necessary condition to bring about liberation was to mobilize everybody, get people organized, and deliver those people in action against the regime using peaceful, lawful methods. And that was, in a sense, a kind of a minimum program. And it, the, the difficulties would arise, we knew, if we started saying to people, well, what is going to be sufficient for us to liberate, excuse me, liberate ourselves? Because then we'd get into a whole debate about do we want armed struggle, don't we want armed struggle? We didn't want to go there. What we wanted to do was to keep ourselves constrained to that which was easily identifiable as necessary and along with that acceptable to the majority of people. That's uh, all I want to say about the thing. Can we, we can end there? Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. Thank you.